I started my business lastminute.com in 1997. We never imagined that 20 years later, basically six companies would own people's web and internet experiences. So, you know, it's, that to me is, is alarming because that is a huge concentration of power in not only um, a very small number of people's hands, but a very small number of people that all look very similar and come from a very small area of the world. So why should we care about this now? If you're Theresa May, our Prime Minister, yeah. and as you Heaven say, help us, let's why? be honest. The country <laughs> collapses off a cliff, things go very wrong. But, but why wouldn't. should the Prime Minister prioritise this, given everything else yeah. that the country faces? Well, now, why, why now? Uh, I mean, this is the absolute moment she has to, because of exactly those things that are going on. You know, Brexit, um, will mean that we have to reimagine what we are as a country, we will have different relationships with other countries, we will have different sets of skills in our own country, we will need to um, re-base uh, the economy in different ways. I believe that unless we think about ourselves as a country in 2027, not even 2017, let alone 1817, which is how I sometimes think we reimagine ourselves, then I really feel anxious for the future of people in this country, and I don't say that in a grand way, but you know, from every angle, we, we know that we have a profound skills issue, but it's not just about that um, skills issue of people not having the wherewithal to be able to do their jobs in the most effective way for them, but it's across all of the services that we're trying to deliver. You know, you look at the health service, it's, it's under a profound attack from so many angles, um, taking away funding from the picture. People in the health service don't have uh, digital skills to be able to perform their jobs as effectively as they could do. But not just that, we have so many complicated systems. We have massive IT challenges, let alone you know, what I would call digital challenges, mm -hmm. as in how to deploy software for us, the end patients or users more effectively. How are we meant to even unpick any of this stuff unless we get um, really realistic about what a modern health service looks like and how we are going to structure it and deliver services using all of the digital tools that we have. Not digital only, not, you know, I'm not kind of being mad about technology taking over the world, quite the opposite. I'm just saying that unless we rebase some of the things that we do, looking at the tools and the resources that we have available to us in the modern age, then I'm really fearful what the country will be because we're going to have the double whammy of having to rethink all of our relationships post-Brexit and we're not going to be fit for purpose. So we're going to have lost out twice, to my mind. So that's one reason why she needs to, because of Brexit. Mm -hmm. But the second reason is because you, know, you look at the way the country is um, likely to uh, emerge over the next 20 or 30 years. You know, taking AI, we have a service-based economy and a number of those businesses are going to be you know, annihilated because of AI. And I don't know whether that happens in 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, but it will happen. Mm -hmm. And you need right now to be thinking very, very urgently about, so what? So what does that mean for what people are learning at school through to what we're preparing them for in work to how we're gonna make sure we have fit businesses that can fuel our economy anyway? So these are the most urgent questions of our time. and. I don't think tech is the answer to everything, but it is affecting everything. So unless you have a grip of it, everything will be less good than it could be. So make sure that everyone has basic digital skills. Mm -hmm. uh, tackle the platform, global platforms that have got our data and that control the money flows. What else should we be doing to make Having sure that society Having completed those two easy challenges. <laughs> you know, I would add to that, not just basic digital skills. I think, you know, for me, the, the biggest things about making sure we have a robust digital economy as well as a robust digital society are looking at um, two things. Firstly, what, how are we designing and building these products and services of the future? Are we building them in the most inclusive and robust way with the most diverse set of talent and voices? And are we making sure that the technology we are building is leading to a human approach? Because sometimes it feels as though tech is really trying to help, but is actually not helping. So are we making sure that when we're building technology for the health service, we're talking to patients enough, we're not just building the next bit of whizzy code or some, you know, something that looks zippy because I'm a young software engineer and this looks kind of neat. Are we really involving people in how 
we're building products and services in the future. And I went, so I went into a small um, cyber security tech startup last week and I was immediately struck by a room with wires and cables all over the place and 100% white male. Yes. What do we need to do to make yeah. sure that people working yeah. in the tech sector are representative of society? I think that that has to come again from a number of different angles. I don't think there's one easy answer to it. But I think that the best products and services are the products and services that are co-designed with as broad a set of people yeah. as possible. And I think that this is why government can play a huge role because government is going to be an enormous enabler for the next wave of services. You know, you've got the insanely uh, hot startups inventing the next whizzy thing that's going to happen to you know, early adopters. But actually, to, I find interesting how you mainline that in the established government mm -hmm. services in that, the we're NHS, delivering, for example. Exactly, that we're delivering every day or in the education sector or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, so government can promote and work with and use its huge weight, not only of numbers through distribution networks, but also purse and money, to make sure that it's working with companies that take a different kind of approach, so that when you do walk into the startup that's thinking about uh, cybersecurity that the government is working with, it looks like a room of different people. So I think government can be very important in that piece. So one final big question for you, or two-part big mm -hmm. question. When you look forward over the next 10 or 20 years, what are you most hopeful and optimistic about in terms of digital's ability to change society? And then on the other side, what are you most fearful of? I'm going to start with the most fearful first. Um, I am most fearful about particularly the gender balance in the sector, but I think also broadening it out to just inclusion of any kind. You know, I don't mean to keep coming back to Facebook, but Facebook's news feed, which goes to now, they claim nearly 2 billion people on the planet, is run by 15 men, 15 software engineers. I mean, the number is quite staggering anyway, but when you see that starkly, that here is a team with immense power, and the way I think about this is, you know, while there are good people in that team, it's all good. But if you need, to my mind, to have the most chance to make sure that team is always good, and to me, 15 mainly white men are not necessarily going to mean that it's always going to be good. I don't mean that women are better or anything, I just think but just more, diversity, from voices. more diversity yeah. more diversity equals better. You yeah. know? And so I worry about it from that level, but I also worry about it when you look at you know any angle of this sector, where does all the VC funding go? To men. Who are all the VCs? They're men. And they're, you know, the common narrative is, oh well there aren't any women. But it's so secular and culturally things have been established so quickly that sometimes you just need to keep opening people's eyes and showing that it needs to be a different way. And I really profoundly worry about that for power reasons, financial clout reasons, design reasons, all of those So things. your dystopian world is basically take us back 200 years. Yeah, absolutely. But it's happening now. You know, you know this, Dido, but one of the most depressing charts I think I've ever seen is from McKinsey, who did a thing about how long to reach parity in various spheres yeah. between men and women equality in various different spheres. You know, political parity, you know, equal men and women in elected offices around the world, I think it was something like 74 years. Bad, but there's hope. In the broadest sense, digital, IT, all of the things that you and I might talk about as tech, never. It will never ever reach parity under common under current trends. Because it's not moving in the right direction. It's not moving. And if it is moving, it's going slightly down. And yet the importance of all of this stuff, as we've already talked about, it's not it's not, not happening, it's happening. Yeah. So it's pretty bad. My dystopian version is pretty bad. It's like Hamlet's tail plus. I'll just leave it to that. No, no, please don't leave it at that. Before you go, what is your utopia? But, what's your but, 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 you know, I'm also an optimist. I think you have to be, if you're in any way, an entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, there are incredible things happening all over the place. And I definitely take the view that everything happens, both good and bad. So if you can find the good stuff and give it clout and power and amplify it, then we'll be in a good place. You know, in taking the climate crisis, it's unimaginable that the current US president has taken that huge country out of the climate um, agreements in Paris, but if you look at what's happening through people using social media or through people building smart, innovative ways to everything, monitor the weather, to manage solar energy in their home, to be connected, you know, I have immense belief that people will solve problems that they give the tools, with yes, digital tools will, yes, solve, will solve the problems. And I also think that there is a moment of reckoning right now. I mean, it may be because I'm in too much of it, but. When I started uh, in tech, it was just not cool. It was awful. People thought I was insane. They'd walk away from me at parties. <laughs> then it had this kind of like amazing renaissance. Wow, you're in a tech startup. And now, you know, 
young people really do genuinely seem to want to, want to work in the sector. But it's also coming off a bit, and that encourages me because we're having a bit of scepticism. We are critiquing, you know, it is being talked about more. We are questioning our relationship to all of these companies. We are wondering whether things we've unleashed are as good as we imagine they might be. You know, you see the CEO of Nest, Tony Fadell, he said, I'm really not sure that being connected to everything all of the time was the right decision. That's quite a big thing for him to have said. Or you see Ev Williams, I'm on the board of Twitter, full disclosure, but Ev, who's the co-founder, said the other day, not totally sure this was all entirely good. And I think unless you have those founders with that moral authority saying, let's just think about this, then things won't shift. But they are. So I'm still optimistic that we can create a much more bright future.